Let me go ahead and get us started this morning. 45 minutes is going to go by pretty fast, so let me pray, pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning <clears throat> quieting our hearts, centering our lives on you. Prepare us for time together here, time in worship, time in your word, time with each other. This is a sacred space. We commit it to you. We dedicate this time to you. We pray for our hearts to be ready today. Help us don't, to not get too far ahead of ourselves, but to let your word and this teaching and all that is going on this morning to, to, to enter into our lives and to change us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, my throat is raspy this morning. So my name is Brian Lee. I'm, uh, I've been at Mac. Debbie and I have been at Mac for uh, since 2000. And uh, this is a, a very special day. Debbie knows how special this day is because this is the Orthodox Church Christmas. So Merry Christmas to all of you. Oh, and it's also my wife's birthday. This is <laughs> Debbie here. So... Be sure to give her a, a big hug sometime this morning. So let me begin with uh, a little bit about my Bible journey. Um, I grew up in one of those uh, homes, <clears throat> one of those families, that we went to church uh, maybe once a month, prayed once in a while, and uh, Christianity didn't really make much difference in the way we lived our lives and our lifestyle, our choices. Maybe some of, some of you can relate to that. And uh, there's a lot that, that went on in between. But let me flash forward <clears throat> to the eighth grade. In my eighth grade uh, English class, my uh, English teacher said just in passing that Abraham Lincoln had read the entire Bible. And my mind flashed back to the pulpit Bible in my childhood church. And I thought to myself, there's no way. No one has ever read the entire Bible. Jesus hasn't read the entire Bible. <clears throat> but uh, I felt inspired. And so that day I went home to my basement bedroom and uh, picked up my little red New Testament that I'd gotten from the Gideons a couple years earlier. I sat on the edge of my bed and I started to read from the first page of the New Testament. Anyone know what's on the first page? First page, what is it? Genealogy. Genealogy. Let me regale you with a little bit. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron. And I got about that far. I remember these, these sounded like Star Wars characters. I remember just closing the Bible and thinking, I'm no Abe Lincoln, and um, I am never going to get through this. <clears throat> Flash forward again to high school, where I met for the first time, to my knowledge, some uh, honest-to-goodness Christians, people that really believed in the Bible. And uh, I had become skeptical about most things, like many high school students do, and so I took it upon myself to try to... Uh, talk them out of believing in this 2,000-year-old book. Instead, they took me into the Bible to see what I was trying to disprove. And this time I got past the first page. 
And in the pages of the Gospels, I encountered a Jesus that I never knew existed. This wasn't the sugar-coated Jesus I had encountered in Sunday school, not the Jesus who's acted out by, by vegetables, not, not the Jesus that, that, you co- that, that, that you color and cover with glue and glitter. This Jesus was dynamic. He was casting out demons and calming storms. He was healing lepers and confronting the religious leaders of his day. I couldn't put the book down. And I still can't. There are seasons in in my life that I have walked away from the scriptures for for, for a season before I go back into them. I think we all have seasons like that or have had or will. <clears throat> I come to, this, to you this morning not as a, a, a know-it-all or a, somebody who's arrived, but as a fellow traveler um, needing to be nudged along in my discipleship journey. And so that's what I hope our time together will, will, will be. A time to inspire each other toward deeper discipleship and a deeper discipline of, of Bible reading and study so that by the end of 2018 we'll, we'll, we'll be able to see the difference in us as individuals and in us as Mac of what time in God's Word does in and through and around our lives. I think of the disciples of the early church gathered in Acts chapter 2 who were devoted to the apostles' teaching to be people who are devoted to God's word. <clears throat> and let me be, be clear, Micah mentioned this last Sunday, but there's nothing magical about reading the Bible. You don't earn more points with God by uh, spending time in his word. But his word is this precious resource that's been entrusted to us to help us know and understand and obey and love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So uh, I want you to, to turn to a neighbor. I want you to say this. God cannot love you any more than he already does. Go ahead and say that to, to your neighbor. <clears throat> God cannot love you any more than he already does, and he will not love you any less. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything there is to know about Bible reading in 45 minutes, but it'll be a start, and it'll, it'll continue into next Sunday. So, so this morning, we're going to spend some time, even before we get into reading the Bible, or looking at reading the Bible, we're going to talk about why, why read the Bible a few things to know about the Bible itself, um, the importance of mental and heart posture when approaching the Bible, and then some practical ways of reading it, including Bible reading plans, reading through book by book, and something called creative scripture engagement. I hope that all of you have gotten a a notebook or a folder from the the back and a pen, because we'll be looking at those and needing those this morning. So we'll continue with whatever we don't do today, Next, next week, and then touch on and practice some inductive Bible study or OIA study of Scripture next, next week. But I want to start by uh, identifying the obstacles to reading and studying the Bible. So in your folder, should be the first page on top, is a, a sheet, a little survey that has that as its title, Identifying Obstacles. And I want you to take just a minute to identify... Um, all the things that have or still keep you from being as faithful to Bible reading as you want to be. And then after, you, after a minute, just take a, a brief moment then to share with a neighbor one thing that you feel comfortable telling your neighbor from your list. All right, so go ahead and do that.
Are we done? You done with that? Good. Am I on? Cool. Well, I hope that 2018 will be um, a time uh, that you will be able to march past some of, some of these obstacles. And I hope that our, the next few minutes this morning will help that. And again, next Sunday will help us to remove some of those internal obstacles. Because I think those are, the, those are the things we need to get at in terms of uh, um, the things that prevent us from being the type of Bible readers that we want to be. And some of what we're going to be talking about this morning will be brand new to some of you. I know some of you here are brand new to the Bible or haven't been in it for a while. Uh, but for uh, many of you, what I'm going to be talking about is not going to be necessarily new. Okay, It's not going to be new, but maybe, maybe you need to sharpen the, the saw a bit. Maybe you've gotten into a rut um, in your life and you need to try something new or re-engage with, with, with Scripture. We can all be better at it. And also, maybe some of what we talk about here is, is something you could pass along to somebody that, that, that you know. So be thinking about the content, not just for yourself, but for someone else. So think about it as an introduction for some of you, as a reminder for others, and for some of you as something that you might be able to pass along to other people. So I want to start with, uh, if we, we forgot to get a roaming mic, you got one? A roaming mic? I just want to ask, why do we read the Bible? It might sound like an obvious sort of question, but maybe there's a few of you, maybe three of you, who would venture to say, why, why should we read the Bible? Sounds like a textbook Sunday school question, doesn't it? To find out what God has to say to us. To find out what, what God wants to say to us. Mike, I don't know if you're able to, to type these in. In the next slide. Okay, what else? What's, what's another? So to find out what God wants to say to us. So I feel like if I'm in the scripture, then the dying to the flesh is more possible. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, if you're in, if you're marinating in God's word, that it's going to make it possible to have God transform who you are and die to the flesh, to take off, as Paul says, to take off these things and to put on other things. Good. Maybe one, one more. I like a version of what George Mueller said, to get myself happy in the Lord. Wow, that's good. Yeah, to, to, to delight in God. To, to delight in God himself. To be happy in him. Let me piggyback on some of, some of, of those. Um, so God has revealed himself to us in two uh, primary ways. Um, are, we up, are we up there? Okay, cool. He's revealed to us, himself to us in two primary ways. One is what is called general revelation. Um, some of what g can be known about God can be known through what he has created. It's, it's common to anyone. Romans 1.20 says, that For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, having been clearly seen, seen being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. But the other way that God reveals himself is through special revelation, namely the Bible, where, where God reveals himself to us, uh, things about who he is, who we are, what the world is like, and what God is up to, what he values, what it means to follow him, what he expects from us, what needs to happen to us to be rescued from our rebellion against him. And then to live a life that pleases God and that loves others well. So the Bible is central to our understanding of all of those things. And God uses scripture to transform us as we submit to his word. By his Holy Spirit, he transforms us. And the Bible, God's word, is one of the chief ways of learning to relate 
to God and to grow in love with God. Not just knowing about God, that's important, but loving God. John 15, 7, uh, that whole passage about abiding, Jesus says that, that as we abide in Him and He abides in us and His, His words abide in us, that, that there's this organic connection between us, between Jesus and His word abiding in us and us in Him. Um, another reason for reading the, the, the Bible is from Deuteronomy 11 um, is to pass it along to our children. Therefore, you must fix these words of mine, he says in verse 18 and 19, in your heart and in your soul. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them, when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So there's a heritage dimension to learning God's Word. Another reason for reading God's Word is to encourage and build up the body of Christ. Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. That we need to be in Scripture so that we can encourage one another. Imagine don't imagine. Think of this beach ball. It's right here. <laughs> and sometimes I, I view myself spiritually as this kind of half-inflated beach ball. I come to church kind of week after week to have my spiritual beach ball reinflated by time in God's Word and worship. And I come here and I'm just hoping that God will reinflate this, half, this half-inflated beach ball. But just imagine if, if we in Mac, if all of us here and the rest of Mac, if instead of coming to have the beach ball inflated, if instead, as we are spending time in God's Word over the week and are swimming in God's Word and marinating in it, that we come to church ready and already mostly inflated and ready to sharpen each other and to speak into each other's lives. Think about how dynamic that would be. That instead of coming to church and connections and life group and Sunday school and dig and summit, needing to be reinflated, that we come to those things ready, ready to give and to invest in other, peop other people. And then another reason to be in God's word is evangelistically. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we should always be ready to give an account, to give a, a defense for the hope that we have. Right? We want to be people who are in the Word so that we are ready to distribute that to our pre-Christian friends and neighbors and co-workers and classmates and neighbors. And finally, one, one reason to read the Bible is that it's been entrusted to us. This, this summer, Debbie and I had a chance to visit uh, Kevin and Lavinia Nalti, uh, MAC members who are now missionaries in Israel. We got to visit them in, in uh, Germany. It was the 500th, 500th anniversary of the Reformation. We got to spend some time kind of uh, thinking about that. We went to the Gutenberg Muse Museum while, while we were there. And... Uh, it features, uh, the, it's in the, in the birthplace of Johannes Gutenberg, who in, the inventor of the, of the Gutenberg press, the printing press. It's a technology that ultimately led to the widespread distribution of the Bible. And it gave us a chance when we were there to be reminded of how kind of pre-Gutenberg life, you know, it was very difficult, very expensive, uh, and very rare to have your own copy of the Bible. We were just reminded of that, about how easy it is for us to access it. We were, we were reminded of, um, of, the, of the many people who were martyred for translating the Bible and people that are still martyred for distributing the Bible. I'm inspired to uh, read the Bible by a story that Nell Gurman re reminded me of in the book called The Insanity of God. I think Jeff, past, 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 Pastor Jeff reference this book too. And there's a story in there of this uh, youth conference in Russia in the early 1950s and uh, they challenged these youth to come together and 
well, they didn't even know this ahead of time, but they, they, they thought of this on the spot, to, to ask the youth to try to reconstruct the Gospels from memory. And that during this weekend, they would, they, would, they would need to come together and try to figure out what the Gospels were from memory. And they were able to do so with just a, a couple of exceptions. And I think, could we do that? If you locked us up in here, would we be able to do that? Um, and then I'm inspired, I don't know is, if the uh, slides are going, no? There we are, here he is. This is a Kenyan man by the name of Kimani, who, uh, uh, they made a movie out of him, it's, he's called The First Grader, because he went back to school, um, went to school for the first time when he was 84 years old. He went to primary school to be in the first grade. And he wanted to go back to school because he wanted to learn how to read and to read his, his Bible. And I think it's for people like that. They inspire me to want to read Scripture. We've been entrusted with this rich treasure of God's Word. And let's not neglect it. It's, it is God's book to us. And we are referred to as people of the book. It's for you, it's for us as Mac, it's for our children, our future children and grandchildren, and it's for people out there that we would love to be in here. So those are some reasons to be, to be reading it. And then let's move on to just briefly a few th- things about the Bible. And again, much of this is stuff you already know. So let me just highlight a few things. Um, Have you ever read a portion of Scripture and come away from it thinking, I have no idea what that was all about or what relevance that might have to my life? There might be a reason for that. (laughs) It could be that every time you enter into the Bible... It is a cross-cultural experience. Have you ever thought about that? You're entering into, whenever you open these pages and walk into this, it's a cross-cultural, cross-cultural experience. You're moving into a place that you're not acquainted with, the Middle East, from 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. The, there are, the authors... Um, refer to places and events that you might only have the faintest clue about. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, um, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through, through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And these authors refer to things, to symbols and numbers and metaphors that you might, only, you might not be able to relate to or understand. And you and I need to be, kind of take a time machine and go back in time but we also need to be like missionaries crossing a cultural boundary. If you don't, you'll end up misreading Scripture through your cultural eyes. And another thing that complicates things is that there are all kinds of different types of literature in here, and and it's a different writing style than we're used to. There's genealogies and censuses and parables, and it's spoken a lot of times in hyperbole. And no wonder we have trouble reading the Bible, and sometimes we avoid it, because it's, it takes work, it takes effort. There's the joy of Bible reading, but there's also the work of Bible reading. 2 Timothy 2 says that we should be people who correctly handle the word of truth. We want to approach and read and study God's word faithfully and carefully and respectfully. And while we have lots of tools to make that easier, those tools aren't going to take away from us the hard work of actually reading it and trying to figure out faithfully what it says. What it means and what difference that should make in, in my thinking, in my choices, in my character, in my attitudes, in my, my behavior, my values, everything. So the Bible consists of how many books? 66. Very good, 
Very good. 66 books organized into the Old Testament, or as a friend of mine likes to call it, the Older Testament. The Older Testament and the New Testament. 39 books in the Old, and uh, 3 times 9 is 27, so there's 27 books in the New Testament. You didn't know that's how that worked, did you? Written over a period of 1,500 years, 35 to 40 authors in this book. We have shepherds and prophets and kings and military leaders. We have fishermen and businessmen, tax collectors, a prime minister, a royal cup bearer, a, a physician, all writing this, this, this book. Um, take out this little page, the Bible at a glance. <clears throat> this flow chart of the symphony of scripture, kind of scripture in five acts to try to break down on this timeline what the Bible is driving toward. The early chapters of Genesis is creation and crisis. The rest of the Old Testament is God's solution unfolds. It's the calling of Abraham and this nation that then fails and then God promising a solution, the, 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 the solution coming in Jesus' early uh, earthly life through, through the Gospels, and then the, um, the book of Acts and the epistles. The epistles were not the apostles' wives. They are letters to the church, the, the, us becoming the church, the multicultural community of God, and then a look into the future and the climax of where, where this is headed in the book of, Reve, uh, in the book of Revelation. And there's different types of genres or literary types, different types of writing in the Bible. And that's alluded to kind of on the bottom, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Imagine coming to, to the U.S. Some of the refugees here would, would, would be able to relate to this. And you're, being, and you're handed a newspaper. And uh, you go from page one and two to about page three or four of the news, newspaper, for those of you who even remember what a newspaper was, you see a cartoon version on page four, this cartoon version of this picture of this, of this donkey and this elephant fighting with one another. And you are take, you're tempted to take that li literally, right? And you're like, what is going on in the animal kingdom that's causing all this conflict? But what you might not know is that on page one, you have, you know, local news, state, national, international news, and then you move into the opinion page on page three or, three or four. Different types of literature. Or think about walking into a bookstore, into Barnes & Noble, and over here is the history section, and over here is biography, and back there is poetry. Well, this is a bookstore that you're walking into. These 66 books various types of literature. It's important for us to realize that because when we say we want to take the Bible literally, what I hope we mean is that we, we, we approach each type of literature in a way that would honor God and honor God's word and get to the truth of his word. So the largest portion of scripture is narrative, is stories, 43%. I don't know if you can read that, can you? The majority of it is, is, is stories, and that makes sense because God designed us to connect to stories and to love stories. That's why we like watching movies and reading, and reading books. We, we, we like to connect with, with, with stories. Poetry is 33% of the book. Poetry and wisdom literature, we have Job and Ecclesiastes and Psalms and Proverbs. And then prose dis discourse is about a quarter of the book. And that's the sections, those are the sections of Scripture that I think are the hardest for us to get through, right? They are laws and direct teachings and genealogies and land distribution and archaeological plans. Architectural, sorry. Architectural plans. So let me just focus briefly on, on the stories, the largest portion of the Bible. 
the narrative sections. The Bible stories are historically based. Second Peter says, uh, chap chapter 1, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The Christian faith rests on events that really happened and people who really existed. God speaks to us through events and people placed in specific locations and in specific times. That might sound very obvious, but you have to realize what the Bible could be, what it is not. Okay? It's not a catechism or a list of doctrines. It's a bunch, or in large part, a bunch of stories from history. And in the Bible, God uses people in those historical settings, especially Israel, as this laboratory of how people have related to God, how people should relate to God, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And these characters, interestingly, are oftentimes flawed heroes, like David and Moses and Abraham and Peter. It might have been easier if God just had given us lists of things, just do these five things, believe these five things. But instead, he asks, us to, he asks us to sift through his words, through his laws and his instructions, his commands, his wisdom, his poetry, and these stories, these historical stories, to sift through them, to learn what it means to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So let me move, move on. I want to just, again, state, state the obvious that the Bible, you'll notice in your, most Bibles, not too many that don't have, chapters and verse, verses. So those, those were added later. For those of you who didn't know that, those were added, uh, the chapters were added in the 1200s and the verses in the 1500s. There's, there's 1,189, here's some, triv some trivia, 1,189 chapters in the Bible, 23,145 verses. And a lot of Bibles have headings in them. Those were added much later. And they, those are all very helpful, but they're not a part of the original or inspired God-breathed text. Okay? And then finally, uh, before we go into starting to read the Bible, and we're going to look a little bit at, at our mental and heart postures, but translations. Um, uh, the Bible was mostly written in Hebrew and Greek, and so it needs to be translated into English or whatever your first language is. So on this, I don't know how well you, well you can see the, the fine print, but on the left, it's kind of a chart of the different types of translations. There's word for word or literal or verbal equivalence translations on the left, and then thought-for-thought, thought, or paraphrase, or dynamic equivalence translations on the right. You can ask Dan and Adina McCloy about that. They work with Wycliffe, so they, they would know a lot more about translation. But uh, our, our Bible in our pews, the ESV, is over on the left-hand side. It's more toward the literal side. NIV is a hybrid right in the middle. And then over on the right, you've got like the, the living translation and the message over on the paraphrase side. And I, I like to use, let me just say for, if you want to see the forest and not the trees, if you want to see the big picture, or maybe you are new to Scripture, or you want to use Scripture more for devotional reading, those would be places where I would go toward the right-hand side of the scale. There's just something refreshing about reading in, it, in, in a vernacular in your you know, in the common language. But for study, uh, and careful study, and word study, and character study, I would suggest going to the, to the left-hand side of the scale. So having different types of Bibles around is a helpful thing in your reading as well. So let's go into the mental and heart posture side of things. Um, there's a story of a, of a young, zealous uh, Christian man who approaches this older man on a train and this older man is wearing a clerical collar. And the young man says to the old man proudly, he says, in my church, we stand on the word of God. And the old man says, in my church, we sit under the word of God. 
there's something about humility. I think that humility is the, is the first posture, the first approach to, to Scripture. It's foundational for us. Psalm 119.18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And in Mark 4, Jesus tells the famous parable of the sower and the seed. And in it, he says that each person's heart is kind of like different types of soil. Hard, shallow, weedy, or good soil. And every time the word of God, the seed, goes out to us, then we are one of those four types of soils. And insofar as it's up to you, choose to be good soil, to be soil that's receptive to God's word. Be soil that not only waits for the word, but reaches up to grab the good seed of God's word. Third, in, 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 in InterVarsity on campus, we talk with students about what we call the four loves. And the first two of these is to love God and to love God's word. And uh, those two are inseparable. Because if you try to love God without loving God's word, your love won't be based on on the revealed God of Scripture and will be quite shallow and misinformed and misguided. Or you can be like the scribes and the Pharisees, on the other hand, and love God's Word, but disconnect that from a word, from a love for God. To look at reading and studying the Bible as the acquisition of knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. 1 Corinthians 8. A teacher of mine once said that um, theology, the study of God, should always lead to doxology, which is the worship of God. That's where we need to be going. And finally, we teach students on campus something called CLST, being curious learners seeking transformation. That you want to be curious, asking good questions, to be a learner, to be humble and teachable, to be seeking which is intentionality, and then transformation, to have a goal in mind. So let's get started with reading the Bible. And if you have questions along, along the way, I'll try to get to those at the end if we have time, or hold on to them and we can discuss them afterward. But uh, the first way of reading the Bible is, I don't know about you, I, I, I used to do this a lot, um, but it's just kind of random reading. You just kind of open it up and hope that something pops out at you. And uh, God can speak through that. That's 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 okay, but it's kind of the it's kind of like a fortune cookie, you know, way of looking at the Bible, looking for words that will comfort us or will challenge us. But the Bible is larger than that. We don't read any other book that way, really, or watch a movie that way. I hope not. That's not fair to the way Scripture is written. And so let's talk about more of a regular reading of the Bible. I I want to encourage you to carve out and protect a time and a place to read Scripture daily, if it's at all possible. I think that, as I talk with, with people, that's the biggest barrier, the biggest obstacle to, to Bible reading, is having a preserved place and time for that. Maybe you already have a rhythm of Bible reading, but if not, let me make a couple of suggestions. One of them is in the folder, what what Micah had mentioned to us last week, of a Bible reading plan that he'll be using and encourages us to use. And Bible reading plans are tools to help us read through the Bible in a methodical way, to keep us on the rails to keep us on track. Either one book at a time or reading through several books at once. And while there's no one-size-fits-all plan, uh, Micah's uh, referenced reading plan seems to offer a lot of versatility. You have, um, you have a reading from the Old Testament, New Testament, and a, and, a, and, a, and a psalm. It's pretty ambitious. You're reading five chapters a day, But it's only five days a week. You have two days a week to catch up. Okay, But that's what you need to do if you're going to get through this in a year. It has a little convenient checkoff list on the side as well. There are other 
plans. There's one actually in the Mac app. Um, in the U version Bible Gateway, blue and the blue letter Bible sites. Those are all sites and apps that are that are in the the resource page in the back of your um, folder. There's a little half page in there with some resources on it. As you start 2018, think about what what is the best. Some of you are on our our starting exercise programs. What is the best exercise plan? What's that? One that you will use. That's exactly it. And a Bible plan is the same way. One that's sustainable. Use one that works for you. If you're relatively new to Scripture, or if reading is particularly difficult for you, let me suggest that you begin with just one or two chapters a day. And to look at a reading plan instead of as a Bible in a year, maybe it's a Bible in two years, or in three years, that's okay. And use the Bible plan, let me try to say this well, to, I, I want to encourage you to simply read the Bible, okay? If, especially if you're new to it. To not be so focused on studying it and memorizing it, those are good things, but to simply get acquainted with Scripture and just read it. And your first time or two through it, even if you don't understand all that you're reading, be patient with yourself. Give yourself grace. Like I said, you're entering into a cross-cultural setting. And just like any missionary, it takes time to learn to adapt to, to this new culture that you're moving into. And while I like having a plan, I know from personal experience and from dealing with hundreds of college students that, over the, you know, that, that the best laid plans sometimes falter. And so you need to not be so locked into a plan that there's no room for failure or grace. If it's a one-year plan, aim to do it in a year. But if you fall behind, don't give up on it or set it aside. Keep on going. Just keep swimming. Okay? Just keep going in, in Scripture. Reading and daily reading, especially, is learned. It's a learned, acquired, slowly acquired dis discipline. And just like, other, just like physical disciplines, there's, you're going to be stretching some spiritual muscles. But don't let falling short of the daily goal get in the way of you just continuing on, just to keep, keep going. And Debbie had a good idea she shared with me. She has lots of good ideas, actually. But she says, she says just like a diet plan or an exercise plan, it's, it's nice to do it with other people, thinking that's pretty obvious, right? It's motivating, there's accountability, but to be able to do Bible reading with other people as well. To make it, you know, in your life group, Sunday school class, dig and summit, challenge each other to read scripture, maybe make it into a friendly comp 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 competition. Um, those of you who have trouble reading, um, let me uh, encourage you, you know, you probably already know, but there are many audible Bible versions as well, and those are also referenced in the resource section. Um, reading book by book. The second reading plan is this kind of open field re, uh, plan. They're all 1,189 chapters are on here. And maybe, maybe what you want to do is you say, you know, I've never read the book of Isaiah, and uh, I'm going to read that this year. And so you just look at that, and you, read, you check off chapters as you go. I think that's a, that, that would be a helpful thing. And while some of the books in the Bible presuppose an understanding of prior books, um, you can get a lot by, out of it by just reading it. And let me encourage you again, particularly if you're new, just read it. Just read it, even if you're not understanding what, you, what you're reading. The first step when approaching a new book in the Bible is to get acquainted or reacquainted with it. When I start a, a, a new book in the Bible, I like to learn a little bit about the background, um, the author, the genre, the t timing of when it was written, the audience, some key themes and words in there. And to do that, um, let me encourage you to invest in a Bible dictionary. Okay, that sounds kind of imposing, and it looks imposing, but it's really an encyclopedia. Next to the Bible itself, I think this is the best tool, either online versions of it or a paper version of it, 
to get acquainted with topics and words and books of the Bible. So to look up, you can look up, you're going to be studying Isaiah, you can look up a brief article that, that will help you to get acquainted with what's in the book of Isaiah. There's also something called the BibleProject.com. If you haven't gone there, you guys know about Bible Project? Have you guys seen that? How many of you have seen that? Raise them high. Cool. Yeah, look at that. There's some, they give a, a brief introduction, uh, an overview of different books in the Bible, the video um, introduction. They're very well done. I, and I would encourage you to do that. So once I go through or look at a background of a book, I like to then page through, especially in my Bible, um, it has headings, and just to page through it and to look at the headings in the book to see where this is going and what some of the main uh, topics are going to be. I was going to have us actually do that this morning, but we weren't going to have time, so I, I, um, I was going to have us look at the book of Amos. Um, but we'll, we'll practice that this next week. Um, when I'm paging through, I try to ask myself these questions. What, what, just from reading the headings and knowing the background, what do I anticipate, what questions do I anticipate having about this book? And what possible benefits or lessons or applications could I anticipate finding as I read through this book? or study this, 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 this book. As you read through it, ask yourself, why is this book in the Bible? What does this add to the Bible? And what would be missing if this book was not here? And finally, I want to, this morning, talk um, about creative scripture engagement. Um, most of Bible study is pretty linear and uh, kind of left, left brain, to use that, that term. It's kind of concrete, linear, logical. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a link listed in the resources that is to Bible Gateway, Scripture Engagement. It's just some creative ways of studying Scripture, reading Scripture. And let me just go over a few of those. Because I want to encourage you to try some new things this, this year. If you're in a rut, try something new. Try something creative that's going to help you to step outside the lines. I don't mean to overwhelm you with some of these. There's a lot of, a lot of different ways of engaging Scripture. I'm just going to go over them quickly. But to try something new this, this year, to color outside of the lines. Um, first one is um, the storying of Scripture. I'm not going to cover all of these, Micah, so I'll just kind of pick and choose here, but we can just go, th go through. Storing of Scripture is taking Scripture and being able to, to say it back to someone in the form of a story. So you read a passage of Scripture and you paraphrase it or memorize it and try to say it back to someone else. If you want to learn more about that, Fred and Carolyn Sayer are experts in storying. Dramatizing Scripture is similar to, to that. Um, Lectio Divina, Pastor Jeff introduced us to that, it was the last spring or fall, and uh, that's divine reading. So it's, it's taking scripture and just reading a short passage of it, reading it several times, and letting God bring to the surface what he wants to draw attention to from that verse. Praying scripture, that might sound obvious, but to take a scripture and turn it into a prayer. Singing scripture, think about how much of the worship is connected with Scripture. And you learn Scripture by singing it, but to be able to do that on your own, uh, especially if you don't sing, sing well, to, to sing Scripture. Journaling Scripture, as you're reading through Scripture, to keep a journal of what you're thinking and what you're feeling and how you're reacting, what applications might come from it. Hand copying Scripture, another good way of, of learning to memorize it. The visual art response is, is uh, we, have a, we have a friend who, she'll read scripture and she's very artistic and she will draw or paint in response to the, to the scripture. And um, we have some of her paintings in our, in our house that are response to, to scripture. Or you can take uh, 
a picture like here's Rembrandt's uh, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And to be able to just sit and look at somebody else's interpretation of, of a passage of Scripture and say, what is it that he's trying to communicate? What are the things that he is seeing and benefiting from somebody else's interpretation of Scripture as well? Next is speaking Scripture. Again, we, uh, in a preliterate society you know, where the Scripture was spoken, it's just good to speak it out and to listen to, to Scripture. Sometimes when we read Scripture, when Micah reads a Scripture from the front, I, I'll have my Bible there, but I'll just listen to it. I just try to listen to God's Word and, and put myself in the place of people that cannot read, right? Uh, manuscript Bible study, we'll be doing a little bit of that next week. Public reading of Scripture is uh, learning how to read at what is called pulpit speed, so learning to read scripture if you're reading in a, in, a, in a liturgical church. Timelining scripture is something we do with international students where you, you take the scriptures and you, and you help people know where they fit on the, on the chronology of the Bible. And then devotional reading and memorizing of scripture. We're going to focus, we're going to start next, next week by talking a little bit about how to use scripture devotionally. There's a, a sheet in your folder that we'll go over next next week, and then memorizing scripture and the importance of, of doing that, of internalizing God's word. Um, that's where we're going to end this, this, this morning. In your folder, you'll see, uh, in the left-hand side, you'll see the next steps. Remember to bring your folders next week. Um, we're going to be going over um, inductive study, inductive Bible study, OIA study. But we're going to be uh, kind of at the end of our time, we're going to be talking about when and where and what of Bible study. And just saying, out, out of all of this, what, do I, what am I going to do with this? And what tools will I need? So you might want to look over some of those resources that are listed um, on that sheet in the back of your uh, folder as well. Awesome. We're, getting, we're coming up on 10 o'clock. Let me finish. We'll pray this. I'll say it as a prayer. You just listen and you can close your eyes. It's a you know, beautiful psalm, of Psalm 119. I'm not going to read all of Psalm 119. That would take a while. I have, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wonderful things in your law. Jesus, we want this to be true of us, that your word would be a lamp unto our feet, would guide the way, and that we would love your word more than honey from the honeycomb. ultimately loving you and learning to love our neighbor as ourselves. God, we ask you to help us, help us as Mac, help us as individuals to be more deeply rooted in your word, to know it, to meditate on it, to memorize it, to have it be part of us, that we could encourage each other with it and share with our pre-Christian friends pass it along to our families. We, we need your word, God. You've entrusted this rich resource to us. We thank you. By your Holy Spirit, would you meet us today as we go into a time of worship. Make us good soil to receive your word and to enter into worship that ultimately that you would be the one who 
loves and is blessed by our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. We'll be here 9 o'clock next week.